Hey you, welcome to The Restart. I'm Kevin O'Connor. Today we're discussing the Boston Celtics and the Philadelphia 76ers. They're a series of mismatches. On one side, you have the Celtics, who have a whole bunch of perimeter scorers that the Sixers aren't equipped to stop, considering the fact they're without Ben Simmons. And then on the other side, you have the Sixers, who have Joel Embiid, and Boston doesn't have the size to slow him down. Boston took game one, which isn't a big surprise considering the fact they were favored heading into the series, and plus the Sixers were the team that had to make a whole bunch of changes anyway. For today's main story, let's look at those tweaks the Sixers made to their system, both the good and the bad, and whether led by Joel Embiid, this team can actually get back into the series. Joel Embiid had 26 points and 16 rebounds, which is a strong game, but this play sticks in my mind. Down four with 140 left, and the game's best post scorer, your best player, doesn't even get a touch. Are you kidding me? Poor game management like this is why the Sixers got outscored by 12 in the fourth quarter. I don't get it. How do you not get Embiid a touch in a situation like this? All throughout the fourth quarter, they had a hard time getting him the ball. You're running offense through Alec Burks and Josh Richardson and Tobias Harris instead of feeding Embiid in the post. It's confusing to me. So how does he go from scoring 11 points in the first quarter to only 15 for the rest of the game? Let's get into some of the things Boston did to adjust and what Philadelphia failed to do. On the first play of the game, Joel Embiid aggressively battled Celtic center Daniel Tice for positioning so the Sixers could feed him the ball. Later, he buried Jalen Brown on the switch. This is Embiid at his best, but they are two of the few post-up possessions all game he scored with any ease because Boston soon sent help. Here, Embiid drew a foul on Tice, but notice Jason Tatum fronting Embiid to prevent the entry pass from Tobias Harris. Boston amped up the pressure. The Celtics doubled Embiid anytime he was on the posts. Marcus Smart digs down here since they're not afraid of Richardson, a 35% three-point spot-up shooter. Embiid did get the rebound, but once he dribbles in, Smart does the same thing again. Embiid seems frustrated and just takes this awful shot. Philly's spacing is still horrific, despite not having Ben Simmons. Just as smart as pressuring Embiid, you've got Thibel standing around in the dunker spot, and that keeps the defender in a help position, and Harris and Milton are way too close to each other. Once again, now in the third, Embiid has no room to operate as he nearly turns it over. The next play, he did lose the ball, as Hayward scurried over and slapped the ball away. Philly has no movement here either. Everybody's standing around. As soon as Hayward starts to help over, Milton's going to migrate from the top of the key to the right wing to make an easy passing lane for Embiid. Milton ended up moving a beat late, but it was too late for Embiid to find an outlet. Embiid could have been helped if the Sixers had Harris, a 38% spot-up shooter from three, standing behind the arc instead of in the dunker spot. The Celtics are willing to let anyone else beat them, though. Tatum totally leaves Richardson to contest Embiid here, and while Embiid is wrestling on the low block with Tice, Philly can't even deliver him the freaking ball. Jalen Brown is in position to prevent the pass, and then Tatum shades over, daring Harris to shoot, which he gladly does. Philly has a deep-rooted issue. When Embiid gets a post-touch, the Celtics aren't worried about his teammates shooting, so they double. But that's if Embiid's teammates can even get him the ball. Midway through the second quarter, he went five minutes without a touch. Philly just went away from him. He became a role player, and they just kept turning the ball over and over and over again. For the rest of the game, Embiid turned into a screener, rarely got any touches, and barely even looked for post position aside from this play. But unlike the first quarter play Embiid scored on Brown, Boston played brilliant defense here. Brad Stevens started the possession with Smart on Embiid and Tice on Thibel because they were expecting a pick and roll and they were ready to switch. Philly ran it, and Boston was prepared to execute what's called a scram switch, which is when off-ball players swap assignments, just as Tatum and Tice do here before Embiid can get a touch. That's game planning at its finest, and as Richardson shoots the three, Embiid's got his hands out looking for a pass. But it never comes, which is too often the case for a player of Embiid's caliber. It's really a shame. Embiid has scored 1.29 points per possession around the rim on non-post-ups and an incredible 1.1 points per post-up, which for his volume as a post player, which we analyzed in our first video on the Sixers, is truly elite. But too often, he turns into a jump shooter. This season, Embiid shot only 33% from three, which is worth an expected 0.99 points per shot. That's lower than what he can do from the post or in the paint. Boston doesn't fear Embiid's shot. 
Crazy step back threes like this won't change the Celtics game plan, nor will this shot. Look at the lack of spacing here though. One, two, three, four, five Celtics, all touching the paint. They have no respect for Embiid's ability to shoot or to pass to somebody else. But here Embiid hits the shot himself anyway. In a comparable situation later, Embiid drove and Brown perfectly timed his help to strip him. But what the heck is Embiid driving here for? Again, five Celtics all in the paint. Here's the thing. No one person is to blame. Philly has a whole host of issues that they're facing. Embiid isn't good enough of a shooter to make the Celtics pay for leaving him open, and he needs to stop settling so often too. His teammates aren't good enough at getting him the ball in the post, and they aren't major shooting threats themselves. And Brett Brown can't control the roster that Elton Brand put together. But I still can't help that some of these problems with stagnant movement and a lack of spacing can be improved upon even with this personnel, and that could help Embiid produce even more. So even without Ben Simmons, the Sixers don't have proper spacing. That play that we looked at from the third quarter with Tobias Harris hanging around in the dunker spot while Embiid was posting up, I asked Brett Brown about that play after the game. Here's our back and forth. There was one occasion tonight where I remember Embiid posted up. I remember on the right post and Harris moved down into the left dunker spot. I guess I'm wondering, is there any any thought to having like four out spacing with all the other guys in the court behind the arc? Zero. And it doesn't make me right, but this is my experience. I, I, I lived with Tim Duncan for five NBA finals, four of which we won in 12 years with Pop. And I'm very privileged to have experienced the world of the post players that relates to spacing and schemes and how people came at them. And one thing that, that, that resonates the most is four on the perimeter is the easiest environment for defenses to double team a post player and have the ability to put out fires as a result. It's too crowded. It's my opinion that when Marcus Smart or Tatum or Jalen Brown goes down to double team Joel, which they do often, if, if you pass out of that, their athletes can put out fires with three on four way easier than two on three. And I think that you're in an offensive rebounding position also if you can occupy that dunker spot. I get Brett Brown coached with Greg Popovich and the Spurs won a lot doing what they did. But what worked 15 years ago with Tim Duncan won't necessarily work today. One of the hallmark traits about the Spurs is their ability to adapt. They changed systems all the time. They had twin towers with Duncan and Robinson. They played the beautiful game with Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili. And then they ran their offense through Kawhi when they needed to in big games. The Spurs were always changing. Brett Brown seems to be forcing players into roles rather than adapting his system to the players to maximize their skills. And isn't this one of the problems? problems the Sixers have had over the years. Brown's response to my question was about Embiid's post-ups, but my initial question was also about the pick and roll. What the Sixers need is more of this, high pick and roll with shooters spaced behind the arc. It gives Embiid the space to roll hard to the rim, and here he makes a beautiful short roll pass to an open shooter. You don't see that a lot from him, since too often there's a player on the block or on the post, and Embiid dilly-dallies around after setting the screen instead of rolling. No one wants to get in front of you, Joel. Don't settle. The Sixers frequently have a player in the way, like Horford is on this play, which takes away driving lanes for the ball handler and removes space for Embiid to roll hard. So Embiid usually pops and takes jumpers, which the defense is cool with. At least here, after Embiid's pump fake, Thibel makes a heads up play and cuts. Hooray for some movement! Whether it's a pick and roll or a post up, more room to operate could help unleash an even higher level of Embiid, just like it does for many other players around the league, both bigger like Nikola Jokic or smaller like Russell Westbrook. Space and movement can also help Embiid in the Sixers. With such a large roster, I can understand the Sixers' desire to play like the Spurs of old. But it's not working. And in order for the Sixers to be more than they've been in recent years, they gotta make some changes. So how many changes can the Sixers really make? Of course, Philly fans would love to see Brett Brown replaced, and I've had league sources tell me that Brett Brown will likely be fired if Boston does beat Philly in the first round. However, it's not all Brett Brown's fault, and firing him doesn't change everything suddenly. I may disagree with him on going with a three-out offense instead of a four-out offense, 
But that's not the end of it. The Sixers need to change their personnel too. Elton Brand's got to make some changes here. He's got to find some guys that can actually run high pick and roll, who can get and beat the ball and deliver him passes on the roll and get him easy entry passes on the post. I'm obsessed with the idea of the Sixers going for Chris Paul. I know he's old. I don't care. Chris Paul solves what the Sixers need. He can run high pick and roll. He can play off ball and shoot off the catch. He's a good leader and he's a really good on ball defender against guards. What? That's what the Sixers need. They are going to have a hard time this series stopping Kemba Walker in the high pick and roll. They're going to have a hard time creating shots. They're going to have a hard time being connected on defense. That's what Chris Paul's the best at. Why don't they try to flip some higher salary players like Harris or Horford with some picks and get a guy who can get them into serious championship contention? That's a bigger conversation for another day, but it's just something that I'm keeping in mind when watching the Sixers team because Philadelphia is not getting by Boston. It's over for them here. They don't have enough defenders to stop the Celtics perimeter scores, whether that's Kemba, whether that's Jason Tatum, or whether it's Jalen Brown. The Sixers have disappointed me every step of the way this season. I picked them to represent the East in the finals before the season, but they're nowhere close to that team. Despite all the problems on their roster, they still have a singular talent in Joel Embiid, which gives them hope. But with the imperfect fit on the roster, with the imperfect coach, it doesn't feel like Embiid has been maximized. For the Sixers to reach greater heights, they need to do everything they can to let Joel Embiid be the best player that he can be. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Restart and thank you to the crew for putting it together. Please do me a favor, go down there and hit that like button and hit subscribe so you get all of the Ringer videos. And let me know in the comments, what do you think about the Sixers? What should they do in this series against Boston? And what should they do moving forward to maximize that Embiid Simmons core? Please let me know. I'll respond to as many comments as I can. Thanks again for checking out the video. Peace out.